will have seen the remarkable exhibition by John Gollings in our triple height space. And we're very lucky that having been presented to us to be able to close this exhibition with actually hearing from uh, John Gollings himself, who will talk about his work. And in particular, uh, we'll talk about seeing or going beyond seeing. So by the grace of God, we all have two eyes. So that is a gift in itself. Now, what do we do with those eyes? What do we do beyond just registering the, 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 the basic details of the world around us? And all of us, in the context of architecture and of design, it's those tools that engage us with the world around us. So what John Gollings has done is go beyond. And so I think if through what you've seen in the exhibition and through maybe listening to him talk about the way he sees and then records and then creates narrative and then creates um, a reality beyond the reality that we see. So that's going to be exciting. And uh, thank you for coming. Um, and perhaps after he's talked, there's maybe a few questions. I want him also to talk about the technicalities of what he's done. Uh, so some of you who are particularly interested in photography and clicking yourselves uh, will be able to learn from him as well. So thank you very much, and may I welcome him to come up. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be here in Ahmedabad. Um, a, a little historic note, I first came to it. Hopefully I can get these overhead lights all turned out. Only because... Um, the photographs, are, there's even more lights to go. <laughs> Much better, thank you. I, I'm leaping all over the idea of, of both um, vision and truth, and um, I'm, I'm going to roam across uh, a whole lot of ideas of truth in the age of digital photography, because with Photoshop, I now have control that the film cameras never gave me. Um, and it's true that uh, photography was invented and gave painters freedom to explore other issues in art. Um, photography was seen to be speaking the truth, that, that you could more or less trust the image in a photograph and it was used in courts of law. And um, it, it's no longer the case. And, and my thesis denotes that you can't trust any photographs ever again. So, of course, we come, uh, this is, of course, <laughs> this narrative now is about to be re repeated in Vietnam. Um, but even I fell for this uh, photograph that was um, patently put together and is um, a, a very well-constructed um, version of fake news. So I want to talk about, uh, first of all, the, wh what a camera does do that was real. Um, and... Uh, Bruno Lesci discovered single point perspective and the optics in a <coughs> camera follow that. And here's something that it, it took me a long time to get my head around, but if you close one eye, your other eye subtends an angle of 45 degrees and that is considered natural human vision. Now, it just happens that the definition of uh, normal vision in a camera is, a, is one whose focal length is equal to the diameter of the image format. And in a 35mm camera, it's um, the hypotenuse of 24 and 36 is 50 millimetres. So any photograph taken with a 50 millimetre lens is considered natural perspective and can be trusted. And my point is that any other focal length lens can't be trusted because it's not the way you naturally view an image. So I'm just going to run through some now. This was the Commonwealth Games that we just had last year in Queensland. Um, and this is a regular believable photograph. And here is an image of man, but this is um, seven kilometres across, um, taken from 6,000 feet. It's an incredible, it was done by a farmer. Um, it's a mark on the landscape, but it, it's so large that you can only see it when you're way up in the sky. And equally, some early advertising photography of mine um, these are recreations, they're not real, they're not photojournalism, they're advertising photographs, but they simulate the idea of mustering horses um, in Wilson's Promontory where I live. 
And these wonderful images of, of painting and, and the oil paint splashed on a canvas, in fact, is the centre of Australia drying out after a monsoonal rain has come to uh, flood what we call Lake Eyre. So at 500 feet going over it, um, the imagery, which in fact is a landscape picture, is, is referring to painting. And similarly, using a photograph, um, you get these extraordinary dots. Now, this is a really fascinating um, talking about zeitgeist. We have uh, Australia has, has flood and drought, and at the moment we're getting flood and drought simultaneously. Um, but the great inland lakes um, get flooded and then they dry out over a period of years. Now, that drying out process is dynamic, so that hour by hour the landscape is actually changing. And this was one extraordinary period um, as I flew over it at 8,000 feet. Um, we got this pattern that, if I can work out where the pointer is. Um, it happens to look a, a little bit like a human backside. And it was interesting to me that there is a concept of zeitgeist in the world that creativity simultaneously happens all around the world. And so I just found it, uh, the, the identical form is coming out in some work that some young artists are doing up in the top right, um, a, a famous painting by Brett Whiteley, um, and, and simultaneously me fluking that, that little uh, image on the other side. So yes, it's, it's truthful, but it's also referencing a lot of other imagery. And equally, one day later, that same Lake Torrent as I flew over it had transmuted into this image. And then uh, another instance, it became this. Extraordinarily painterly. And then, of course, as we start to get into the farmland, we discover that the sheep work in these extraordinarily almost phallic patterns as they walked across the field. This is a small, a tiny little mountain range um, just outside Melbourne where I live. Um, and I was commissioned to photograph it for an exhibition and I had this idea that I'd get up in an aeroplane and, and try to express the forms. But in fact, the one that I finally chose is, is this one, which is exactly the same mountain range, fundamentally different approach, but it's talking about the fact that a petrochemical plant um, blocks the view from the, uh, the land. Um, but simultaneously, in a sort of pay on of praise to uh, the, the climate in Australia, I, I dwelt on the sky falling above it. Another bit of perception, the palms in Dubai um, a, a quite fantastic <laughs> and ludicrous piece of architecture, I, I have to say, um, but turned into a piece of abstract art simply by the selection of the lens and, um, and position in the helicopter. So truth can vary by time. And here is a new um, project for an, uh, an arts precinct on the Gold Coast, um, which is called Surface Paradise in, in um, Queensland. And this is, um, of, of course, I have to say, I'm now using a drone instead of a helicopter because drones are fantastic for architectural photography. So this is a shot in the middle of the day, positioning this um, new concert venue uh, against the background of the high-rise buildings. But then later in the afternoon, you get down on the ground and you get this totally different uh, appreciation of the building. And then as the sun sets in the afternoon, the building transforms into a totally different um, place. And then at night, uh, it becomes an another truth again. Same building, fundamentally different um, understandings of its role in within the landscape. And then the climactic moment before the, uh, the rock and roll bands get out on stage. But then that identical building, if you go around the back, becomes this very elegant piece of off-form concrete. So it, it's a sort of schizophrenia that, um, given that my self-appointed role in life is to find the one definitive angle on a building, this building defeated me because it patently is schizophrenic and has two angles. There it is again. 
And now we get to some other truths. This is the raw camera file of um, Uluru, which is the, that enormous rock in the middle of Australia. Um, by doing nothing more than re-examining the, the raw digital data, this is the same image converted um, by me in Photoshop uh, to extract information that is there but not seen originally because raw data is just a readout of voltages off a camera chip. And equally, of course, is uh, truth in time of day. So this is um, another little mountain range in central Australia called the Olgas, and this is the Olgas at sunset. Same mountain range shot with a thousand mil lens from a helicopter at dawn. So it's we go from that to that, and, and one could ask which is the real object. And another extraordinary bit of prehistoric landscape. Um, and what makes this powerful is that I found this schism running absolutely down the middle of the picture. And in a funny, perverse way, a lot of my work has, and you might have seen that in the exhibition, um, I quite like the idea of putting a tree or a line through the middle of the picture so that you don't quite know whether you're meant to be looking at the line or looking at the images behind it. But it's a way of formalising and giving the viewer enough discomfort to make them actually think about the images. So I, I do like that vertical line. And again, using the landscape to search for ways to put four walls ar around a, a composition and um, working from the air is, is the best way to learn about composing because it's very difficult hanging out of a helicopter and you're trying to balance forms, negative and positive imagery, content perhaps, are you talking about environmental damage, are you talking about the sheer luscious um, description of some composition. A and there's the refined one which joins these um, two little white bits of water. So from real to unreal, but more real, but untrue. Um, so uh, going back to the mid 80s when Unix computers had just got enough power to composite imagery, my work as an architectural photographer involved photographing a lot of three-dimensional models, those, those real models that were built out of balsa wood and plastic. Um, and then clients were saying, could I cut the picture of the model out and stick it over a picture of the background in more or less correct perspective and, um, and, and produce a marketing image? And I was the first person to use that technology to actually scan uh, an analogue picture of the model, in this case um, a 60-storey building there called 101 Collins Street. Um, on the banks of our Yarra River and have it digitally composed. And the cost then in, I think, um, around 1984 was 4,000 Australian dollars, which would be something like $50,000 now. Um, so that was the first, my first use and experience of the control that digital photography could give you. Subsequently, I realised that since most of my work as an architectural photographer in involved models and proposed developments, I started a business doing CAD rendering of uh, architectural um, files. Um, it was a genius idea because the, the client himself was going to work in 3D and all they had to do was give me their files and we would model it. And, um, but where I broke ground was, was doing it in, in bringing my architectural photographers on and not necessarily doing the blue sky and sunshine but looking at more evocative weather. And so this is a, a, a wholly computer-generated picture of a model, but electronically dropped into a real background. Now this is a new apartment block that's just going up in Sydney. Um, this again is the raw file, and this is what we delivered to the client. Now these are very simple changes, but the, uh, the lamp poles I took out and because the construction wasn't finished in the foreground, um, I desaturate it and select it and just whack a little bit of motion blur across to look as if we're driving past it. The eye doesn't get distracted by the extraneous building material and you can concentrate on the forms of the building. Last year I went to um, Villers-Bretonneux to open the Australian War Memorial in France and um, 
I took a drone across there. And of course, you can see in the background the uh, the seating was ready for the Anzac Day celebrations. A, a lot of Australian soldiers died in uh, Villers Bretonneux. Um, but the client wanted a description of this quite subtle underground um, interpretation centre that they'd built with a grass covered roof. So this was the reality. And this was the final picture that we delivered to the client. Now again, architects themselves are generally doing their own in-house rendering. In, in many cases, they've stolen the people that I trained in my own business and they put it in to do their in-house rendering. So this was the image that the client gave me that they, that they felt represented the interior and it was my role to match it. And this is what I came up with. Um, now, this in turn is, is not real. It, it's a composite of hundreds of images and I, I put a few here. First of all, on a 17mm tilt shift lens, I got the, uh, the ceiling exposed correctly. Now, this was actually shot during the opening ceremony and I was given no help by security and there were hundreds of people moving through. So with the camera locked off on a tripod, you progressively photograph so that you can get little tiny bits of imagery. So this is one bit. And then we've got another bit and you can see someone took their coat away, um, their, their coat and seat. So that started to clean up. And then I'm simultaneously looking for people that might simulate the original rendering. And so then we get a few more. And then we get another one and another one as people move around in mills. And then we get another little bit and then another little bit where they finally cleared out on the right hand side. So all of these are assembled in layers in Photoshop and we erase them until I get the combination of shot that I want. Equally, I was asked to do this dust shot of a, a newly renovated theatre in Melbourne. And here's the final shot, made up of every one of these images. So each one, a lot of the effort went into getting the flag and the exposure of the flags with all three of them flying at once. Um, there's a lot of bright light, so you can see my hand blocking some of the picture because I just wanted to expose the background. There were cars going past. It was a bit like MG Road. Um, and so that's the imagery that was put together in Photoshop to produce that picture. This is Australia's embassy in Bangkok. Um, we had arranged for the staff to turn all the lights on. And of course, you can guarantee when you ask for lights to be left on that they turn them all off. So the reality was this shot and I was getting very depressed about ever getting a photograph out of it. And then suddenly we got the entryway turned on and it transformed the reading of the building into this warm inviting entrance with this dark forbidding quite solid bit of architecture behind it that made a very powerful memorable photograph. This is uh, Ren Coolhouse did a, a little pavilion in Melbourne uh, two years ago now. Um, and I always have a commission to uh, document these pavilions for the opening. And it's always a rush on opening day. And in fact, the, of course, the builders are running late. Again, I had this drone image of the angle which showed the roof and the structure of it. And this is what we delivered. Again, put in overnight and rebuilt somewhat clumsily, I've got to admit, because we only had an hour or so to do it. And then at the final opening of that evening, um, this was how it uh, turned out. And then this project gets moved. So from this setting here, it was then given to Monash University and, and reinstalled. And these were my shots of it under setting sunshine in Monash. And again, our National Gallery um, holds an architectural um, commission each year for some adventurous and avant-garde architecture. And it's built in the gardens of the National Gallery of Victoria. A and again, here's the, uh, the drone shot of the builders desperately trying to get it finished. And this is us cleaning it up and uh, idealising it and op optimising it. Now, this is the stock in trade of my work. This is um, a commission to photograph a new restaurant on the beach uh, down in Melbourne. But in fact, this was the reality. Um, I wanted the dawn light. The client had or a client who's an architect, had specifically said, could I choose an angle that shows the separation of the ground plane and the elevated building that looks out onto the bay behind it? 
so by a lot of uh, brief, the, the, the shot was very fixed. And, and of course, they needed the shot the next day. Um, so what we delivered was the exactly the same photograph, but optimised in Photoshop. And there's a lot going on. The delivery trucks down there were delivering the, the food. They would be there for about a half an hour and then they'd drive off. And so I patiently took enough photographs that by cutting and pasting, I could get rid of all the delivery trucks. The construction in the foreground was that trick I described of selecting it and just blurring it. There were some air conditioning units on the roof. Now, I don't think air conditioning condensers are part of the architect's intent, so I take them out. Um, and then we slightly increase the saturation to get an image of the building as the architect intended it, not to do with reality. There's a lot of um, new mosques being built, ironically, in Australia, and uh, this is the newest one. And they're tending to reevaluate what a mosque is and, and how a mosque can operate within Australian suburbia. And so this is um, a new one in Punchbowl in Sydney by an architect, um, a young Italian Roman Catholic, ironically, called Angelo Candelopit. Um, and this I decided was the best angle on it. We had really bad weather. Um, I had a radio controlled flash, so I did light the entrance way down there. But the shot that we delivered is this. Um, made of multiple exposures. If you haven't got good weather, then you increase the, the drama of the sky. Um, it was on a 10 mil Voigtlander lens on a Sony A7, which is covers 140 degrees fully corrected. But it, it gives me a, a formal presentation of the um, all the wonderful concrete elements. And then it was stood up um, in Photoshop. So that's... Uh, so we go from that to that. And the inside is this extraordinary interior of um, over 80 little uh, mini concrete domes. And of course the builder hadn't finished. You can see the construction wall. So in Photoshop we uh, rebuilt the interior to get the finished shot. This is a secondary school, like a high school um, in Melbourne. This is a new science teaching block. Again, the, the, um, there's always a demand to get works delivered to put into architectural wards before the building <coughs> is finished. So we put in the grass and, um, and choose a better sky and get a bit of sunshine. Another new art gallery, a private art gallery um, with a, a wealthy man's collection. Um, this was the reality and this is what I delivered. Now the interior shot, v very simple, um, but they were still moving the artwork in when I had to photograph it. So I made a point of slightly blurring, but showing the curators actually moving the crates of art around. And that goes back to some very early work I did, again, when I was asked to photograph an art gallery that wasn't finished, um, that had flexible walls. So like one of those animated drawings in the sort of carpentry handbook that I remember as a kid, I got curators to variously climb up walls and push them around and carry paintings through to animate the uh, image and build a narrative. And, and the building of a narrative is, um, is, is part of what I see as my role now in digital photography. So building on that narrative and the flexibility that a, a digital camera gives you because you can screw the sensitivity up way beyond the sort of conventional 800 ASA of a a film job, um, I can have curators, uh, again, um, walking through the space. It's still an architectural photograph. I'm not trying to show the art, but I want people to have scale and a sense of activity. So, and there again is the entrance. <coughs> now, none of this is real. Um, every single person is made from a separate frame and put together in Photoshop. So the chap on the left blurring his way into the picture is actually hiding some unfinished thing. Um, I work at a fifteenth of a second because that gives you a, a blur on people that doesn't destroy the form but stops it being a portrait. And, and then I control the composition of people within the overall composition. And this is another little joke. Um, 
I replicate the same person running through the shop. So if I haven't got enough people, I just use the one person um, and they become symbols. So again, coming back to landscape, and landscape photography for me has been a generator of a lot of ideas that I then put into architectural work. Um, every 10 years or so, Australia burns, and it, it burns fiercely, and often there's a lot of people are killed. But what it does is completely reveal the hidden landscape of human occupation, for good or bad, uh, underneath it. And I've spent years documenting um, the revelation of uh, human um, impact on the Australian landscape. And so here we see these again, quite luscious images of just spindly tree trunks that have been burnt out. But you can just see those very soft, subtle tracks that have been going through the forest. And these are the ones that otherwise would not be seen. And I'm, I'm drawn to the sparseness and simplicity of, uh, of this imagery. But to me, it's um, it's intended to be a big comment on human uh, intervention in the, in the landscape and the breaking of the purity of it. So you get these chevron forms um, and these little tractor offcuts that you can't normally see. And then I discovered in this reference of Jackson Pollock, I guess, um, a particular genus of pine tree, which when it catches fire and burns out, leaves an orange ash. And, and it, it just created this quite extraordinary um, composition that um, is hard to believe is, is a, a straight shot from a helicopter. And there it is again. And I'm particularly drawn to the power of this imagery. And of course the canola fields that um, the farmers grow. So here is truth by interpretation. Um, truth is what you want to read into an image. Um, Australia digs the biggest holes in the world to uh, extract iron ore and gold. And this is what's called a super pit. Um, it takes a truck an hour just to drive to the bottom to drive back out again. But I discovered um, that as they're digging the overburden, and in Australia, of course, there's a lot of mineralization, um, every one of these little dots or pixels here is one dump truck with a particular mineral. And when it gets oxidised and exposed to the air, it turns into these fantastic colours. So you've got the cobalts and the nickels and the magnesiums. Um, and of course it started to remind me of the dot painting of the Australian Aboriginal in, in exactly this area. And so then... Um, I discovered that the, the waste byproduct of Australian mining was actually producing these extraordinary um, images of landscape, which in turn um, were reminiscent of the dot painting of the Australian Aboriginal, which in, in itself is an aerial perspective, even though they've never flown. And, and so I got quite excited by this, and um, this work was shot in 3D and shown in the Venice Biennale in 2010. So subsequently I've been photographing with even more interest in discovering um, a, a body of work which is about human occupation and human intervention and human destruction, but at the same time has this lyrical, wonderful beauty. And by coincidence is um, part of this work I've been doing in, um, this very early rock art of, of Australian Aborigines uh, has gone through itself in stylistic movement. So <coughs> 30,000 years ago, they were doing these stick figures in ochre, um, which are more or less describing daily life and rituals. Um, now, the same stick figures are interpreted by sort of amateur artists um, on a clumsy house in uh, the Northern Territory. It just shows how pervasive this... Um, uh, this extraordinary art from uh, the Aborigines has become into the Australian mainstream. And it's just one of those little bits of irony. But equally, I was privileged to be asked to photograph this extraordinary cathedral of rock art, which has just been discovered. Um, ironically, um, this was is understood to be the meeting ground of a lot of Aboriginal tribes, but there are linger um, in the fields, and I... I I got incredibly excited. No one in Australia knows what a linger is. Um, 
and uh, so it, it just cemented this idea that in fact this has Indian origins. So this is the snapshot that the average person would take, but this is what I actually presented um, as my interpretation of the site. And this is, it's only just been discovered, it's been carbon dated 30,000 years, there's been quite a bit of overpainting. Um, but it's the only known instance of masonry work being done. Some of the columns were pulled out. They had enough tools to fashion the capitals on the columns and to really create a, um, a cathedral of, of rock art. And those stone making skills have been lost amongst the Aborigines subsequently. So of course there can be truth in the photographic record by time because something exists and then doesn't e exist. In 1973 I photographed every building in Surface Paradise because it was sort of a, a, a working class destination for holidays building on mimicry of um, Miami and Florida. And um, so this is one of the shots of um, a little cafe in a barbecue place. Um, in 2012 I went back and re-photographed with the same cameras and lenses exactly the position that I'd stood in uh, 1973. Uh, and it makes a profound comment because that, that's it to this day. It's an empty block of land and it's surrounded by really ugly bland high rises. And equally, this was the car park uh, in 1973. And this is it now. It's actually inside a shopping centre, but <laughs> we triangulated and worked out exactly where I stood. And again, um, another car park, full of nostalgia, of course, for those um, 1973, what seemed to be very simple times. And that is it now inside a, a lingerie shop. So this was the landscape and the identical shot now. I find the power of re-photography is, is really profound. It's, it's one of the best uses of photography that, um, that I can think of, and, and these are particularly good examples. Ironically, the project that Arthur and I met on um, documenting the Vijayanagara Empire at Hampton had been documented in 1856 by a Colonel Greenlaw with a series of wonderful images of it. And um, I got permission to do a re-photography survey of those photographs, which are now in the Canadian Centre for Architecture. So I've been doing re-photography for a long time. So this is another one. At this stage, of course, we were um, <coughs> trying to document or find an Australian equivalent to Venturi's um, study of Las Vegas. And um, we were looking for those drive-by icons. And, of course, in Australia, it had to be a mug of beer. And, and this is the, the tragedy now of um, this really awful overscaled um, concrete hotels um, with no sensitivity to the ground plane. And another one. I mean, this is tragically bad architecture. The 1973 Gold Coast at night, and, and again, the, the impact um, up to 2012. So you can see that uh, what is truthful and what is real is, is a very perplexing issue. And um, I, I think photography in, in this day and age uh, really sums up um, the, the whole dilemma. So here's a, a clumsy example of the, the Queen of England walking through with a, a little begging sign um, saying she <laughs> <laughs> if you give her $5, you can have a photograph with her. <laughs> so this, this is in Melbourne. Um, I couldn't resist it to, to just prove, because this is you know, central to um, Trump's whole uh, obsession in America, but um, there she is. Have a photo with me for $5. In fact, it came from um, a student who was in there with a, a, a Queen uh, Elizabeth head mask uh, holding up the same sign in the same location, which I simply transposed. <laughs> and again, just playing with um, imagery. And this is more of service paradise. Now, these shots that I'm about to show are complete fabrications and constructions Normally in an architectural photograph I'm taking people out because they're not dressed well or they're looking not appropriate to the situation. I've been building a body of work in Surface Paradise and actually putting people in. Um, 
to build a pattern of to, to to make a narrative simply to talk about this um, resource. And so I stand on the street corner and I photograph hundreds of people and I collage them into the shot. Um, and here they are having a picnic on the beach. You'll notice, of course, that um, by dint of brilliant town planning, um, the, the beach is shaded from the sunshine <laughs> because of the uh, overshadowing. Yeah, this is my evocation of the, the classic Aussie beach. Um, we, we do live on the beach, but it's, uh, it's never quite as crowded as this. Yeah, then we get these... Um, because I am up in a helicopter quite often, uh, I see these extraordinary congregations of people. And to me now, the human impact and the landscape and what's been revealed by burning and bushfires are starting to meld into the, the one visual amorphous. Um, so a couple of miles away was a, a, a rock and roll concert. And looking down from the helicopter, there's just this extraordinary picture of... Um, people. So thank you for coming. Don't believe anything you see anymore. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. That, that is um, the cat among the, the pigeons. <laughs> um, so if anyone is challenged by any of that, is outraged, is delighted, uh, is shocked, uh, perhaps uh, they might like to ask uh, John Garland a question or challenge him in some way. Um, so would anyone like to... Or any to technical question. A lot ah. of people, it's ah. considered not, not kosher anymore to ask technical questions, but I love them. Yes, yes, <laughs> please, please. Yeah. Taking the angle of a building, sometimes what happens is one side gets a little bit bent, even though if it's 150 mm. And there are too many of uh, wires, even though using uh, multiple shots and placing it up on Photoshop, it's uh, impossible to remove those wires. Um. <laughs> For me, it's really difficult uh, at certain places. That's the reason why I was asking. It's a serious issue. Um, we, I actually employ someone who is a specialist in taking those wires out, painfully retouching them out completely. The latest Photoshop has some quite good tools for automatically doing it. In some cases, we do it quite roughly, um, simply to stop the eye immediately leaping towards it. Uh, in Melbourne has trams with tram wires, so it's a particular problem for me. Um, on the other hand, my photographer friends in America insist, I mean, in that weird conservatism of America, they actually believe that you shouldn't touch the photograph at all. You put your four or five camera on it and you photograph it warts and all. I fundamentally disagree with that approach and I will use Photoshop wherever I can to get closer to the architect's inspiration rather than the reality. But in terms of degrees of difficulty, uh, you... The only other way I can suggest you try to get around it is to put a very wide angle lens on and get in closer and get rid of those wires. But then that destroys the natural perspective of the 50 mil lens. So there's no one answer except being obsessive and trying to get rid of them. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, a question mm. for, for John. Um, with respect to having landed up in India in 1980, uh, and then now it's 19, uh, 2019, uh, that many years ago, nearly um, whatever it is, uh, uh, a long time. 40 years. And so <laughs> the perspective on India, in the m as much as we've been seeing India, as much <laughs> as you've been seeing Australia, and um, have you been, and you've been documenting as well, mm. uh, is that something that you'd like to comment on? Just the first one is a personal note that the, the first couple of years I came back from India, I thought I had the solution to all their problems. Um, and now I wouldn't dare um, dictate any solution to any problem that I see in India. I, th that's just old age and wisdom. And realising that it's, uh, as a society, you're incredibly complex and incredibly lucky in many ways, but there are equally uh, massive challenges. 
the first thing I note is health. Um, certainly for people coming from the West, the introduction of bottled water has made a fundamental difference. I, I was almost killed by amoebas in Hampi. Um, I think I've, I've still not put the weight back on. Um, uh, the other one is the road system. Suddenly you have freeways that generally don't have someone withholding their land and stopping a whole national highway actually working. Um, the introduction of power tools uh, has made a big difference to the quality of architectural construction, of building construction. Um, on the other hand, because I cross between China and India a lot, um, in some ways I feel democracy, as wonderful as it is, is holding you back. As there are too many points of view are given uh, too much credibility. In China, the government just says, we will do this, and they bulldoze a hutong and, and build a new building. Um, at the same time, I think the architectural quality of the modern architecture I've seen in India is really superb and is setting world standards. So, yes, you're definitely improving. You're not developing economically as quickly as China, but I think you're doing it without the human suffering that the Chinese are, and I think... Um, Ultimately, China will have a convulsion and India won't. Any other comments people have to make about what they've seen? Um, is anything to do with the work that people do themselves, as the, ph as the photographers? Uh, just to share some of that? Um, no, could, look, I've, I've got a couple of little tips uh, that in have influenced my work. There is a a famous Australian architect, Harry Seidler, who gave me a lot of his work. And I was um, photographing with him once and, uh, and I found this really great composition of the uh, entrance portico of his buildings. And, and he looked at the, we used to pull polar Polaroids in those days, and um, he looked at it and said, this is rubbish. And, and I stared at him and he said, you haven't shown the whole building. He said, if you don't show the whole building, it could go on for another 100 metres. He said, you've got to, never ever take an architectural photograph that doesn't show the whole building in its context. And that rule I've stuck with all my life. It means that I don't do the artful details that are about my creativity. I'm only interested in allowing the viewer a credible critique of the piece of architecture. And um, you will have noticed tonight every single shot included the whole building and where possible its setting. And I think that's a, an important role to anyone photographing buildings. Don't get carried away shooting some wonderful pattern of shadow and light and shade because that's about you as an artist. It's not about the architect as an artist. Right. I suppose um, the discussion goes on in your heads. Uh, we generally try and engage with a bit of a, a banter, uh, <laughs> but we know that there's a lot to take away uh, you'll have seen the exhibition. That in itself was an amazing uh, gift from uh, John Gollings. And I must now thank a few people, if I may, Please. Uh, because first of all, to John himself and for the wonderful connection that he has with India and with us, because it's through this great connection that was established, first of all, by Snehil Shah, who is our alum and who many of you will know as a colleague and uh, maybe as a, as a teacher. Um, but it was Snehal who brought uh, John and I up to Ahmedabad from Hampi in 1980. So thanks to Snehal, uh, we're both in fact still here. Um, so that is a, is a first uh, vote of thanks. Uh, thanks to your wonderful High Commission and uh, your High Commissioner indeed who came and opened the exhibition and all the great team at the Embassy who supported making this happen. Without them we wouldn't be here either. To our own team in the library uh, who helped uh, manage the show and uh, make it happen for you all here. Uh, to young Tim, who may be here, he's from Australia, he's our current Australian representative, uh, who uh, very kindly looked out for the exhibition every day and watched um, uh, just to make sure that it was the way it should be. Um, and to uh, the Lilavati Lalbai Library itself, which contains the exhibition centre, which is promoting excellence. And it's where you, as students, where in the context of your studios, think and wonder, and then come to the library in the exhibition centre and see excellence. And that's what we're trying to promote, is the best 
of whatever it is that we can bring to you on Shirith. So thanks for coming, thanks for supporting, and if anyone wants to chat to John after the show, he's very happy to uh, take more questions. So thanks again, and look forward to seeing you at the next lecture, which is two days from now, which is Dr. George Michel, yeah. <laughs> our, our master, and at whose feet we sat in Humpty in 1980. So he too is coming back here, and he is talking about the Islamic architecture of the Deccan, a completely different <laughs> context and subject, but also through a wonderful eye. So the eye has it, and the eye has to travel. So all of you, once again, taking home with you your wonderful pair of eyes and open them wide and see what goes inside. So don't stop, don't stop. Please keep looking. And thanks again to John for leading us, for challenging us, and for sharing his great skill. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>